Hello and welcome. Thanks for joining us. Um, this is one of our Stories of Change webinars. I'm really excited for this one. I think it'll be really fascinating. Um, my name is Julia McLeod. I'm the Outreach Director for the Harpswell Heritage Land Trust. Um, I just wanted to show you um, the next couple of webinars in our series. We have Words and Watersheds with Gary Lawless on July 22nd, and we have Bats Behavior and Wind Farms with Trevor Peterson on August 31st. Once a month, we'll be hosting these webinars um, and you can find recordings of all our past webinars on our website. So there's lots of learning opportunities for you. So just a little bit about this webinar. Um, I'm gonna ask some questions at the end. So you're welcome to put questions into the chat at any time and then um, we'll take them up at the end. And without further ado, I'll just pass it over to John Allen. Thanks for being with us. Thanks, Julia. I am going to um, rely on Julia, as she said, to uh, interrupt if there are any issues or uh, any problems with the screen sharing and things like that. So hopefully we can make this work. I'm going to throw my slides up here. Start this. So I'll just say a couple things really quickly uh, about myself. So I am currently an associate professor of biology at the William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia. I also co-direct our undergraduate program in marine science. And if uh, you want to follow along with any of the adventures that I'm going to talk about today, you can do that on Twitter. Um, on the lower left, I've got our Twitter handle, which is AllenLabWM for William and Mary. And then on the right, I've got our Instagram, which is Larvy Rock, not Lava Rock, but Larvy Rock. And uh, that's our Instagram if you want to see pictures of students doing fun things in Harpswell and beyond. Um, before I was a professor at William and Mary, I taught for a year at Randolph Macon. College in Ashland, Virginia. And before that, I was at Bowdoin College for three years as a postdoc. And so I uh, worked out of where I am right now, the Coastal Studies Center, which is now the Schiller Coastal Studies Center. Um, and before that, I was a PhD student at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And before that, I was a college student at Bates College in Lewiston. And so that's uh, really my first experience with working in Harpswell was as a college student, as an undergraduate coming down to giant steps to see sort of some of the iconic rocky coast uh, in Maine. So um, that's just a little bit about what I, where I've sort of come from. For the last 15 years on and off, we've been working in Harpswell um, on Bailey Island, Orr's Island, and the surrounding areas. And I'm going to talk today about connections between the work that we've done here in Harpswell and work that I've been doing in Australia on the Great Barrier Reef. And that's what this beautiful picture is on the screen. This is a picture I took a couple field seasons ago on the outer part of the Barrier Reef in Australia, just to show that it's not all dead. As you may have heard, um, there are parts of it that are very much thriving and alive, and we're hoping to conserve those parts and keep them around for my kids and your kids and um, their children as well. And so the link between Harpswell and the Great Barrier Reef may not be obvious, but the way I'm gonna link them today is through these animals called starfish or sea stars and really use those sea stars as a um, paradigm for understanding how animals respond to a changing world and the environment. So <clears throat> here's the plan for today. I'm gonna to start talking about the basics of research in my lab and how undergraduates drive the success of the research that I do. I'm gonna give you an example of an applied problem, the decline of corals on the Great Barrier Reef that requires a basic, in quotes, solution. I'm gonna explain why that word's in quotes and, and tell you a little bit more about what basic science versus applied science means and why basic science is so important. I'm also gonna, in that, talk about this really critical role that the research we do here in Harpswell plays in informing that research that we do in other places, like in Washington State, in Virginia, in the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, and give some examples about how poorly we really understand the biology of the animals with whom we share the main coast and what we don't know and why that uh, filling in those knowledge gaps is so important. So, um, the way I think about work in my lab is that 
the research we do, certainly what drives me and what drives my students is curiosity about the natural world. So whether that's um, the student on the left here wondering why this whelk is the size of her head, um, whether it's this student in the middle who's standing on a patch of sand dollars that are four or five thick, um, one on top of each other and actually learning how to spawn sand dollars out in the field. So she's holding a little syringe, injecting salt into them to get them to spawn. Uh, this student in the middle who's holding a big 20 armed starfish in Washington state, a student who's holding a chitin that's the size of a small baby and she's basically cradling it like a baby, which I love. Or the student on the far end um, holding these slime stars and wondering why these stars that are the size of like a grapefruit can produce gallons and gallons of slime and why they would do that and what they would do that for um, in nature. And so that um, curiosity can kind of be boiled down to asking this simple question, which is why are there so many different kinds of animals and how do they work? Why do these animals look the way that they do? Why do they behave the way that they behave? Why are they have five arms or no arms or 50 arms and what drives those changes in phenotype, both in an evolutionary sense, but also an ecological one. And so when I think about those kinds of questions, I describe those and other people describe those as what's called basic biology. So this means in a, in a science sense that you're discovering new knowledge and new information without really worrying about how it's gonna be used. So what you're creating is really knowledge for knowledge's sake. And sometimes that's really critical, but it's not always clear when you're collecting those data, what it will be used for. This is in contrast to applied science. So taking information that already exists and applying it to a particular solution um, for a problem that you're faced with. At William & Mary, we have a big graduate school of marine science that's a good example of this. They do a lot of work on things like how many crabs live in Chesapeake Bay, or how will oysters respond to a disease that's been introduced. There are problems that are discrete that are presented by either aquaculture or commercial fishery uh, activity that lead to solutions that are generated through science. And those are fantastic, but they're not what drive me. The questions that drive me are basically, how do those blue crabs work? How do those oysters actually work? And not so much how many are there, or how could we get more, or how could we make them tastier? All important questions, but not what I'm interested in. Um, but these basic questions and these applied questions obviously overlap with one another. They're not limited to just one or another. They're in intercalated with each other. Um, nonetheless, whenever I have to submit a grant, the first thing I do before I write the proposal is I have to fill out this form and check a little box that says, am I doing basic research or applied research? I don't actually know what they do with this information. It's a little disturbing. But what's fascinating to me is that because these two types of research are so closely intertwined, we're all benefiting right now, at least those of us who've been vaccinated and even those of us who aren't from the application of basic research. So the research that went into developing the mRNA vaccines that many of us, including myself, have inside of us right now was driven by basic inquiry into how molecules work, the biochemistry, the molecular biology, and then it get up, gets applied later on. So I'm gonna tell you some basic science and how that gets applied to trying to conserve places that we cherish, like the Great Barrier Reef, but also more locally, how that could be applied in Harpswell. So here's the big framework for my lab. We work on marine invertebrate animals. So basically everything that lives in the ocean that doesn't have a backbone. We study in different projects, their ecology, their evolution, or their development. And these three circles all obviously overlap with one another. So for example, when we're studying the larval ecology of an animal, we can't really study their larvae without understanding something about their development. When we're trying to understand the phenotypic plasticity of an organism, how an animal responds to environmental change, obviously that's gonna be related to their ecology. And all transitions of genotype into new phenotypes occur through development. Development is what drives and modulates those changes. So all of these facets of our research are tied together pretty closely. And depending on the project, we lean more into one than another. 
one way I like to think about the connection of those three subfields of biology is by thinking about the life cycle of an invertebrate that lives in the ocean. So this is um, pretty much my favorite organism. It's one of the, my favorite um, slides. There's an animal called a brittle star, and some of you may know these. They kind of look like sea stars, but they have long skinny arms that fall off all the time, which is why they're brittle stars. And they live on the bottom of the ocean. So this word benthic means that they're living on the bottom of the ocean. The adults release eggs and sperm into the water column. When those eggs and sperm meet, there's fertilization. And the fertilized egg eventually develops into a larva. That larva swims around sometimes for just 15 minutes, sometimes for 15 days, sometimes for five to 10 years. So some larval stages actually persist longer than my undergraduates are in college, all right? So for some animals, this can be a really long time. But for many, it's on the order of a few days to maybe a few months. And then they return to the bottom of the ocean and settle as a juvenile. And one thing to notice about this brittle star is that when it's adult, an adult, it has this five-part symmetry. When it's a juvenile, it has this five-part symmetry that's characteristic of sea stars and urchins and sand dollars, all the things that we call echinoderms. But as a larva, it has bilateral symmetry. So you can bisect it down the middle and have two equal halves. So this transition or metamorphosis from larva to juvenile is sometimes thought of as being analogous to like a caterpillar turning into a butterfly or a tadpole turning into a frog. But in those cases, you have a change of habitat and a change of morphology. Here you have a change of body symmetry. So it's a massive transition in their life cycle. Nonetheless, what I really want you to take away is that all these organisms have very different phenotypes, very different appearances when they're eggs, then when they're larvae, then when they're juveniles, then when they're adults. And the forces that shape those appearances are what we're interested in studying and also understanding why they change so drastically from one stage of their life to another. So the story today is really about two animals. And in this case, it's two groups of starfish. So locally in Harpswell, it's about Asterius. There are actually two species of Asterius in Harpswell, a Northern species and a Southern species. The Northern species is Asterius rubens. The Southern species is Asterius forbesi. Forbesi comes up from places like Virginia. So not unlike us in the summer. Rubens, the northern species, actually is native to Europe and in interglacial periods like we're in now, it comes across the Atlantic and down uh, the eastern seaboard and meet, the two species meet in Maine. And actually that's sometimes beneficial and sometimes problematic for our research because those two species hybridize with one another. And so along the coast of Maine, if you pick up a sea star, it's probably a hybrid between the northern and the southern species. Um, so this animal on the left is our local, I like to say Virginia sea star, you all might say your local Maine sea star, but this is the southern species, uh, Asterius forbesi. And on the right, this very different looking animal is also a sea star, it's called the crown of thorns sea star, abbreviated cots. So when I'm saying cots, I'm talking about this spiky looking guy. And both Asterius and cots are what are called keystone species. One lives in the Gulf of Maine, one lives on the Great Barrier Reef, one's temperate, one's tropical, but they both play really similar roles, meaning that they have outsized influences on the ecology of the system. So the way that a habitat looks, the productivity, the biodiversity of that habitat is driven oftentimes in a top-down way by these animals and the way that they consume the dominant competitors in the environment. For something like an Asterius, it might be dominant bivalves like blue mussels uh, or oysters. For something like a crown of thorns, it might be corals. The other thing that unites them besides that keystone role in the ecosystem is the way they look when they're babies. So this is a baby Asterius. This is a larval Asterius. And just like in the brittle star, it's got that bilateral symmetry. You can draw a line down from top to bottom and split it into two equal halves. Other than that, it doesn't really look much like a sea star. It's got these funky arms coming off, but it's got a mouth and an esophagus and a stomach. It's got a complete gut and it floats around in the plankton and it eats algae. And that's really important because they need a lot of food in order to grow and develop. And the amount of phytoplankton that's available for them to feed on determines their success. And that's true both of Asterius and of Cots. So 
Um, I said that these cots have uh, something to do with the success or failure of the Great Barrier Reef. So I'll talk a little bit more about their connection to corals. And here's just a picture I took of a cots in Australia. It's a, actually a group of several species, but the species I'm talking about is Acanthaster solaris. And cots are really good at eating corals. And you can distinguish um, when they've been around eating corals because in this picture on the left, you see this white patch. It looks like a bleached coral. All the other coral has color. It's sometimes purple, it's sometimes orange, it's sometimes green or brown. But the white patch is where a cots has come along, crawled over top of the coral, stuck its stomach out through its mouth, which is on the underside of the animal, and dissolve the coral in place. And in this slide, you can see um, another patch of white coral that this cots has just crawled off of. So they move around and they just eat the coral and they are um, really coral eating machines. And they're big. They can be a meter in diameter. So these things are big. They've got all these spines covering their surface. They're venomous, so you can't pick them up or you have to pick them up very carefully with tongs or something. Um, and outbreaks of these animals have been devastating coral reefs. And these coral reefs take a long time to grow. So they can take more than 100 years to grow to their full size. And the outbreaks of cots have been occurring with increasing frequency. And surprisingly, the outbreaks of cots are responsible for about 40% of the decline on the Great Barrier Reef of corals in the last 30 years, up until the last couple of years when we've had some really severe bleaching events. So if you compare the effect of crown of thorns predation to coral bleaching, which you hear a lot more about, coral bleaching accounts for only about 10% of the decline in coral reefs on the Great Barrier Reef. So that's not to say that's not important. It's tremendously important and it's increasingly important in recent years, but understanding this top-down predation by starfish on corals is actually a huge local driver of the success or failure of coral reefs. And one of the reasons that cots outbreak is because they're pretty abundant. So think of the Great Barrier Reef as basically being like the length of the Eastern seaboard in the US. It's a big place. There are about 10 million cots adults living on there at any given time. Those are dispersed across a big area though. So at any given time, they're usually at a low density. When they erupt and become very dense, they can wipe out patches of corals very quickly. And so people are concerned about the factors that drive these outbreaks. One of the reasons they outbreak so quickly is a single female, one large cots, can produce 100 million eggs at a single time. So this image on the right, is a cot's female that I've induced to spawn and I've just taken pictures of all the little eggs floating out from her body as she's spawning. So think of that one animal can make a hundred million more animals in a single season. <clears throat> the upper limit of that is actually double that. There's some records of 200 million eggs per single female, but a typical very large female would be about a hundred million. At any given time during the reproductive season, you can go out and you can sample the water on top of the reef. And you can ask how many larvae are floating around on the Great Barrier Reef ready to jump down and start eating coral. And the best estimates we have suggest that during the spawning season, at any given moment in time, there's about 30 billion with a B larvae floating in a continuous cloud over top of the Great Barrier Reef. That is sort of terrifying if you're a coral. All of these potential predators floating on top of you um, as you're uh, waiting for them to metamorphose into a juvenile that wants to eat you. From our perspective, what this means is that small increases in the survival of those larvae can mean really big rapid increases in cots populations and could explain those outbreaks that are so devastating to the health of the reefs. So because of this, because of this intense interest in preserving the Great Barrier Reef, because of the prominent role that cots play in determining that success, they're probably the best studied sea stars on earth. Despite that, there's still a ton that we don't understand about them. And this image is just demonstrating a small piece of our ignorance about the species. On the left is a normal cots larva. And on the right is that same larva a few seconds later 
and it's split in two. And you might say, oh, what did you do to this? The, you know, why did you rip this thing in half? I didn't rip it in half, it ripped itself in half. So these animals have the ability to clone themselves. And this is something that my lab group published just uh, about two years ago uh, in, com in collaboration with some of our Australian colleagues. So it turns out that these larvae, again, 30 billion larvae floating in a continuous cloud over the coral reefs in Australia, they can split themselves into pieces and those little pieces can regenerate and form new larvae. So one egg does not make one larva. One egg makes one larva that makes two larvae or more. And so we're trying to understand the forces and the factors that drive that. And this was something that was completely unknown. And the Australians actually gave us a grant to go there and work on this because they understood that if this happened and they didn't know whether it would or not, but if this happened, if it happened even just 5% of the time, if you had 5% of those 30 billion larvae floating on top of the reef splitting into two, then that means more than a billion additional cots on the reef. That is problematic to say the least. So why did they come to us and why did they ask us to do this work? Um, it's because we had done work in Harpswell on Asterius, on the local sea star species here. And we had shown that the larvae that float around in Harpswell Sound and off Bailey Island and in off Orr's Island clone by fission, they split themselves in two. And it turns out that the best known species for doing this kind of um, cloning is Asterius forbici, the local species in Harpswell. And what they do is they just split right along the upper part of the body. The mouth pops off and swims away and the esophagus and the stomach swim away. So you get what we call euphemistically head clones and body clones. And this is what it looks like in Asterius. Here's the head, there's a mouth, Here's the body, there's an esophagus, there's a stomach, but there's no mouth. And so an undergraduate of mine, Holly Blackburn, who graduated in 2013, did a MD at UVA, is doing a PhD at Yale, studying cancer biology. For her undergraduate work, so before she went off to do those wonderful things, was studying the reproduction of these little clones. So here's a little piece of a head, it's just a mouth. It's just a floating mouth. It's microscopic. That floating mouth over the course of a few days begins to build a new esophagus. It begins to build a new stomach. And once it's built a new stomach and a new esophagus, we can start giving it food. And if we give it phytoplankton food, then it very rapidly grows in size and becomes a fully functional larva that can reach metamorphosis and can become a new sea star. So this was really surprising to us. Um, and hopefully it's a little surprising to you. But that simple behavior, splitting yourself in half, the top part and the bottom part being functional animals that can go on and become functional adults is something that can really dramatically drive up the population of any given species. So we took this information to Australia. We worked on uh, these cots, as I said, Emily Richardson, who's pictured here as a master student who helped me with this work. And we found that one of the main drivers of cloning, that what causes cloning to happen is increases in algal food. So increases in the amount of phytoplankton that these animals have to eat. The more food you give them, the more likely they are to clone. We messed around with things like larval density too. And this is the only data slide I think in the whole talk. So bear with me on the um, dark gray bars is high food treatments. And if you compare the dark gray bars to the light gray bars, which are the low food treatments, you can see that at a density of three larvae per mil, um, it's a little more than double um, the amount of cloning per capita. When you increase the density, you get that same effect. The dark gray bar is higher than the light gray bar. If you increase the density more, the dark gray bar is still higher than the light gray bar. Basically the density of the larvae didn't matter, but the amount of food we gave them mattered tremendously. And so what we took from that was that phytoplankton abundance roughly doubles the frequency of cloning in these animals. And why is that important? That's important because there's a story that's true basically all over the world, which is as you have increasing coastal development, you tend to have increased in coastal agriculture. This is true in Chesapeake Bay in Virginia. It's true in the Great Barrier Reef. It's true generally globally. And as you have increasing 
agriculture and coast agriculture and coastal areas, you have increasing runoff. In Australia, this comes in the form of runoff from sugarcane. And when I flew into Townsville and was driving from Townsville north to Lucinda, which is about an hour and a half drive, I asked the person who was driving me what we were going to see along the way. I thought this would be a great chance to see a part of Australia I'd never been to before. And he said, all we're going to see is sugarcane. And he was right. That was all we saw except for these big empty parking lots. And in those big empty parking lots along the road, what was in them was empty bags of fertilizer. So there's tremendous quantities of fertilizer that get dumped onto these sugarcane fields to produce the sugar that largely goes to Asia. Um, and that sugar gets shipped out on these long trains. There's a train that goes from the coast out into the open water and gets picked up on a shipping container. Um, and they just ship tons and tons and tons of sugar out. And that's great, I like sugar. Um, but what it means is that you have this tremendous influx of nutrients onto the relatively nutrient poor waters of the Great Barrier Reef that leads to phytoplankton blooms and that's good for larvae and bad for corals. So our data support this um, bottom-up explanation for crown of thorns outbreaks, which is called the nutrient runoff hypothesis. And it basically goes like this. You have expanding coastal agriculture that leads to an increase in fertilizer use. That increased fertilizer use by default leads to increased runoff of fertilizer onto the reef. That causes an increase in phytoplankton blooms. That leads to an increased number of larvae, both by inducing cloning events, but also by increasing survival of all larvae, whether they clone or not, because they have more food. The more food they have, the better they do. So <clears throat> this is problematic. Larval cloning is probably increasing as the waters of the Great Barrier Reef become eutrophic. And um, even if that doesn't happen though, Larval cloning is something that seems to be an, inher an inherent trait of the cot. So even under the low food conditions, we always saw some cloning. So this is something that happens regardless of what is happening out of the environment. You can't really stop it, but you can greatly reduce it by adjusting the amount of phytoplankton that they have available to them. So what this means when you add larval cloning into this slide that I showed earlier, is that really the complex life cycles in marine invertebrates should be called not complex enough life cycles in marine invertebrates because we're missing in this planktonic larval stage a big chunk of the biology of these animals. And this, in this case, what I'm talking about is larval cloning. So I wanna bring this back um, from Australia to Harpswell. And I want you to think about another local echinoderm species in Harpswell. These are um, different pictures of my favorite animal, again, these brittle stars. Um, these are taken over at Basin Point. So this is a nice local um, snapshot of the uh, subtitle here in Harpswell. And if you think about how these animals function, because there are a few people other than the, the poor students who have to work with me in my lab who really care a lot about brittle stars. And I think they only care because I am forced them to. Um, but people generally don't care that much about brittle stars. So if you're gonna justify working on them, it's really a, a basic question. How do these animals work? Um, and interestingly, just like the sea stars, the life cycles of brittle stars are much more complex than we give them credit for. So these are some pictures I took at the Coastal Studies Center here of larval brittle stars. So up at the top is a nice, beautiful, bilaterally symmetrical, again, larval brittle star. It's got all these long arms that it uses to feed. It's got a belly full of algae. That's this orange gut here in the middle of the animal. And it's got these long red arms. And those long red arms are the most important parts of this to remember. But as it grows, it basically eventually resorbs all of these parts in the middle. And it turns, it metamorphoses into something that eventually looks like a little tiny brittle star. So what happens at settlement is this long pair of arms pop off and swim away and the little juvenile crawls off onto the bottom. And that long pair of red colorful arms floats up into the plankton and begins to make a new larva. So they clone themselves. They make a new individual from a single egg. And this process can be repeated again and again and again. And in fact, we don't know for Asterius, for the brittle stars, for the crown of thorns, this may go on forever. So one of our grant titles um, from a few years ago was whether these are essentially eternal larvae. Could these larvae just keep cloning themselves 
forever. And we don't know the answer to that, but they can go through many cycles in a single season. And I'm gonna show you this life cycle more clearly, but I have to give credit to another student in my lab for making it clear um, because she's a fantastic artist. Her name's Anna Melhorn. And so all of the nice drawings of brittle stars and their life cycles that I'm gonna show you um, are her creation in collaboration with me, but she did all the hard work. I just told her what I wanted to look, look like in scribbles and she made it look pretty. So here's some of her drawings. And this is just the basic brittle star life cycle. The benthic adult, a fertilized egg, a larva swimming in the plankton, a larva that's beginning to metamorphose, um, and then eventually a juvenile that settles onto the bottom. And if you like her drawings, I stuck her um, Twitter handle on here too, if you want to follow her. Um, she's very, she's a very talented artist. Um, so this is the sort of standard life cycle. When we start to add in some of the cloning, you get this new layer of complexity in the way that this looks. So here, this pair of larval arms swims off, the juvenile crawls away and becomes an adult on the bottom. The larval arms that swam off become a new larva that eventually develops into a big larva that eventually becomes a juvenile and the pair of arms swims off again. And that cycle just keeps repeating over and over again. And what we've done in the most recent work is to ask, what if that life cycle is actually even more complicated than I made it sound? It's already pretty complicated, but what we noticed, again, a few years ago, working at the Coastal Study Center was that our cultures, we would start to see these little arm pieces floating around in them. And some of them are very tiny. I mean, all of these things are microscopic, but some of these are maybe, you know, smaller than an egg of one of these animals. And we thought, well, what if these little pieces of arms that they seem to be just dropping on their own actually regenerate and become new larvae? And so we tested that hypothesis and here's what it looks like. Um, these are actually images I took in Washington state last summer. The species in Harpswell is circumpolar, so it actually um, moved from the Pacific across the Arctic and then down into the Gulf of Maine. So there's a population in Maine, there's populations in Washington, they're the same species. And these images are from the population in the Pacific Northwest in Washington, but the same thing happens here in Maine. And what happens is you have this long straight arm and over a course of a few days, it gets shorter and it gets fatter. And as it gets shorter and it gets fatter, it starts to rework some of the pigment in its body. And eventually about a week after that arm has fallen off, it's made a new little bilaterally symmetrical larva. So here's this little larva. It's got a mouth, it's got a stomach. It's all much smaller than the original animal, but those larvae are functional and they can form juveniles. And this is work that Erin Darby McLean, who's here this summer, this is a picture of her um, on the Coastal Study Center property I took last week. Um, she's very excited about this worm that she's collected. This is work that she's been doing with me over the last um, couple of years, really. And so she's here studying these animals this summer with me and finding lots of clones already, which is very exciting. So we're interested in understanding how this new layer of complexity in the life cycle feeds into the population dynamics of these animals. So we now have the original life cycle, a secondary life cycle, a tertiary life cycle, and it turns out that it's even a quaternary stage of the life cycle because at metamorphosis, some of these animals drop just one of the larval arms. So one arm swims off and makes a new larva. The other one sticks around and gets reabsorbed into the juvenile and then forms the juvenile on the bottom. So you have what we call arm pieces that pop off or full arm pairs that pop off or a half arm pair that pops off. And in all of these cases, these little pieces that are falling off of the animal can turn into new larvae and new juveniles and new adults. So this is fascinating if you're a basic biologist like me, because you're just completely excited about how often this happens. We have data on uh, how frequently each of these occur, about 30% of the time in these two parts of the life cycle, about 10% of the time in this um, quaternary part of the life cycle. And then we can do things like calculate, okay, how many extra larvae would there be if you had on average you know, 10% cloning or 20% cloning? And under what conditions do you get different frequencies of cloning? Does it happen more under high food than low food, like in the sea stars in Australia? Is it related to temperature? Is it related to salinity? 
And we don't know the answers to those questions yet, but those are some of the questions we're asking. So one thing to know is that brittle stars are amazing. Uh, I think that, and hopefully you do too. The other thing to know is that, you know, the difference between this original brittle star life cycle that I described to you and the one that I show here is pretty significant. And this is all work that um, some of this has been known for decades. Some of the, um, the middle part here has been known for a long time, but all of these other parts on the outside are new and we're adding those in. Feels like almost every month we see something that we haven't seen before. Um, so what that means is what we don't know about marine invertebrates, not just brittle stars, but sea stars, not just sea stars, crabs, lobsters, you know, pick an animal that you're interested in on the coast of Maine, and we don't know a lot about them. What we don't know is much, much greater than what we do know. And that actually motivates us and, and gives us hope for understanding and changing things in the future. So you might be saying, well, how does not knowing things give us hope? Um, but it turns out that identifying what we don't know might end up helping us to save coral reefs. Um, so this is true in the case of now knowing that these animals clone in response to increased eutrophication, not that we needed another reason to try to prevent eutrophication on the Great Barrier Reef, but now we have one. But it's also true that not only do we not understand how these starfish work, but we also don't understand a lot about how corals work and how corals work might actually be more important in terms of us understanding how they'll respond to climate change. So this is not work that, that has been done in my lab, but has work that was done um, a few years ago by these gentlemen, Hayward and Negri, and they published a really cool paper, and it's one of my favorite papers, so I'm gonna just briefly tell you about it. Um, it turns out that corals also can clone themselves. So not only are the things that eating them are eating them cloning, but they themselves can clone. And they do it during their developmental stage. So in the upper left here are a bunch of early cleavage stages. So two cell, four cell, eight cell stage coral embryos. And those coral embryos float up to the top of the water. And so you might know that um, corals go through these mass spawning events in the fall, uh, in our fall and winter in Australia in their summer. And these mass spawning events mean that, you know, hundreds of species of corals are spawning at once. Thousands or hundreds of thousands of animals all release their gametes on a single night. Because they're very buoyant, they float up to the surface. And when they float up to the surface, what happens is it's sometimes a little windy. And about 50% of the time, it's windy enough to create a little chop. So just think about a little chop on the water in Harpswell. And that chop on top of the water is enough to break apart these embryos. And that sounds bad because you're ripping apart a living embryo, but those embryos that get ripped apart in the surface of the water turn into small embryos. The ones that don't get ripped apart turn into big embryos, but all of them continue to grow and develop. And the big embryos become big larvae and coral polyps and the little embryos become little larvae and little coral polyps, but they all continue to grow and survive. And this is something that we don't understand really at all, how this works, how often it happens. The few data that we have suggest it happens very frequently and is probably really important to the population dynamics of the corals. So understanding how the corals work, understanding how their predators work is going to be key to helping us understand how to either conserve or restore or manage these ecosystems. So, um, I want to again come back to Harpswell. So I'm bouncing around the world here. Um, but here's how you might be able to help. And this is the way I like to think about this. Um, be curious yourselves. Be thinking about why animals do the things they do or why algae do the things they do, um, why fish do the things they do. Um, pay attention to how your backyard is changing. You probably have noticed if you've lived here long enough that there are many fewer sea stars, for example, than there were historically. This is not unique to Harpswell. Um, it's not unique to Maine. It's something that's happening along the East Coast of North America and especially along the West Coast of North America. So my lab does research, as I said, briefly in Washington State. And in Washington State um, in 2014, when we were there doing research, there was the largest observed die-off of animals anywhere in the world at any time in recorded history. 
literally millions and millions and millions of starfish of many different species all died from something called wasting disease. There's a similar phenomenon in Maine. For a long time, people thought it was a virus that was causing this disease, but it turns out it's actually probably temperature induced rapid growth of biofilms on the surface of these animals. These biofilms grow so fast and thick on top of the surface of the animal, it makes it hard for them to breathe. So even though they're underwater, they still need oxygen and they need to breathe. And when they can't get access to the water because there's a biofilm growing over them, they can't breathe and they wind up dying. And it's really very sad. This is a slime star. What I showed you at the beginning, the, the girl was holding um, the slime star and there was all this clear slime coming off of it. This is what the animal looked like when it's wasting. It develops these big pock marks and holes. And um, you sometimes see sea stars in, in Maine and elsewhere where they just turn into piles of white mush. Um, but a lot of this seems to be driven by changing temperatures. And as you may also know, the Gulf of Maine is warming faster than almost anywhere else on the planet. It's in sort of the 90th percentile of places um, in terms of how quickly it's warming. So this means that you will see changes in your backyard, but it's not just about paying attention to those changes and noting them. Um, it's also about thinking about how you might help people like us, <laughs> scientists doing work there. These are two of my students um, working out at Basin Point looking for, um, in this case, uh, mud snails and sea urchins. Um, but maintaining and allowing access to field sites is really critical to the science that we do. And it's not just our group, it's people all over the world who come to Harpswell or come to Maine to do research. And, and so one way to do that, I'll put in a plug for the land trust is to support the Harpswell Heritage Land Trust because having access to just go out and count what's there and how that's changed over time and to create hypotheses that we can come back into the lab and test about how that's changed over time is really critical to the work that we do. So um, I just, I've got a couple more things to say, but I'm just gonna pause and just acknowledge a bunch of people um, and funding agencies. So a lot of the work that I talked about was funded by US and Australian government agencies. So in the US, things like the National Science Foundation, um, the Virginia Space Grant Consortium, which is a part of NASA. Um, in Australia, the Australian Museum uh, provided funding for us to go to Lizard Island and Orpheus Island to do work on the COTS. We've worked in Washington at Friday Harbor Labs and here in Maine at the Bowdoin Schiller Coastal Studies Center. So we've been really generous um, benefactors, which has made this work possible. I've had amazing students who've worked with me. I've mentioned some of the students who are up in this top row already. Anna was the one who did the drawings. Matthew and Amanda um, were here a few summers ago. Um, Emily and Danny were here a couple summers ago. And um, Danny, Brianna, and Amanda did a lot of work in Washington with me on cloning. Um, the group this summer is actually pictured on the left. So we've got a group not only from William and Mary, but a colleague of mine from Holy Cross and three of his students. Um, and they're actually in the other room um, in the Coastal Studies Center here where I am. Um, and hopefully they're still awake. And uh, they're all fantastic. So there's six students here with us this summer doing research. And then I put this picture of um, Karina, who's a former student, up last because I, I wanted to just tell you that um, there's a lot of stories that I could tell you about um, life in Harpswell and the intertitle and the subtitle, and I don't have time to tell you all of them. But I just want to give you a, a glimpse into like a totally different story, um, which is just that marine life in Harpswell is strange. And this is a, um, the underside of a little juvenile sea star. And I'm just going to play this movie um, just to, tell, to give you a sense of it. So there's a, there's a sea star here, um, and it's sticking at its stomach. And that stomach is wrapped around another sea star. So in the middle here, you have, as it's crawling around, a little sea star. And what's happening is that the, um, the big sea star is cannibalizing the little sea star. And if we fast forward ahead, you can see that the little sea star is getting totally surrounded by the stomach. So the, the big sea star is sticking its stomach out and it's dissolving um, its species mate. In fact, in this case, it's its sibling. Um, and over time, that little sea star disappears and gets completely consumed by its big, its big brother or big sister in this case. And then once it's totally eaten, that big sea star just bolts and runs away. 
And it's like, I didn't do it. So um, it turns out that that notion that newly settled starfish can cannibalize one another, even in the presence of alternative food sources was not something that we knew previously. And all that's left behind when they do that are little skeletal elements. So basically the sea star just leaves behind a few little bits of skeleton. And it turns out that's really critical probably to understanding the biology of these species. If cannibalism is important in these juvenile elements, um, and the juvenile life stage, that's a whole new area of inquiry. And we're just scratching the surface of that. This is work that we just published in April. And part of the reason I mentioned it is you might've seen this online. Um, the biggest tabloid newspaper in the UK, the Daily Mail, um, did a, a story about it and Karina and I were very amused by it. So not so cute after all, baby sea stars eat each other, an unexpected case of underwater cannibalism. And I mentioned this only to say, that you never know where harpswell organisms are going to appear and where the influence of these animals is going to show up, whether that's helping us understand how the reef works in Australia or in a tabloid newspaper in the grocery store in the UK. Um, and I'll just putting up this picture to show there are many, many stories like this about lots of different animals, sand dollars, lobsters, crabs, worms, um, snails, that I could tell over the years, but I, I don't wanna keep you here all night. So um, there's lots of things that we've learned about the way that the world works by looking at and being curious about the animals that live here. I'm especially curious about how these two animals work, which are my two children who are laying on the beach in Washington state with giant starfishes on their faces. And they are my favorite field assistants along with my wife. And I will stop there and hope that um, maybe there's a couple of people left and that you have some questions and, and Julia can uh, direct me to them. So let me stop sharing my screen and see. All right, thank you so much. That was great. I'm a little envious of your students. I'm sure your, your enthusiasm and curiosity is catching for them. So that must be, I can imagine that being fun to work with you. They were up at 4.30 this morning, so I'm not sure they would agree with you right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, that can be fun in its own way. Um, so I welcome anyone to type in questions in the chat. Um, and while that is happening, I have a question of my own. Um, for those who know me, you know that I'm really passionate about working with slightly younger children. And I met John first through him welcoming my campers from Nature Day Camp into the Marine Lab at the Schiller Coastal Studies Center and showing them some things there. And that's always been a really popular part of camp when we've been able to do that. So I was really inspired by that beginning of your talk where you're saying that your lab is driven by the curiosity of your students. And so from my perspective, I'm curious, how do we encourage young people to be curious? That's a great question. Um, I think there's a couple different ways, and, it, and it's, of course, not the same for everyone. Um, for, for me, the way that I get excited is by, you know, having hands-on experiences, which, of course, in this virtual world is harder than ever, but hopefully we're, we're coming out of that. And I think that, you know, that's why I love doing things with the campers. Like you said, that's, um, that's how we've interacted in the past. And it's just amazing to me to like, you know, when you hand a, a small, a small student, I'll say, um, a sea star and they're just like, I can touch this. It's not going to bite me or what. And they just like, and it's, like, oh, it's slimy. Oh, it's wet. You know? And like that, immediately makes them, I think, start thinking about why does it feel this way? Or why does it crawl this way? Or why isn't it running away? Or is it scared of me? Should I be scared of it? And those kinds of questions, I think, are the way to draw people in. So we do, back in Virginia, um, in the elementary school that my, that my boys attend, we, again, in pre-pandemic times, would do basically like a show and tell where I bring animals in um, and uh, show them, you know, critters of all kinds and ask them simple questions like, how old do you think this lobster is? Or, you know, how old is this starfish or whatever? And just getting them to guess and think about like, how long does the starfish live for? Is it older than me? Is it older than my mom? Is it older than my grandmother? Those kinds of questions, I think, fascinate them because for me, when I teach marine invertebrates, I tell students, you know, the, 
the, the oldest animals on the planet, the fastest growing animals on the planet, the fastest animals on the planet, the longest animals on the planet. These are all invertebrates that live in the ocean. And most people have no idea that that's the case. And so um, they're really, you know, understudied. I was telling Augie, who's one of my students here this morning, that like, you know, there are a few people who study the things that we study um, and there should be more. <laughs> and I hope there will be someday. Yeah, thanks. Um, okay, there's a couple of questions. I'll just read them out. Um, one is, how does the new facility at ORS help you continue your work? Yeah, so the new facility, if you haven't seen it, if you haven't been to the, the Coastal Studies Center um, since it's been uh, renovated, you may not recognize it. The marine lab is largely the same. So in terms of the, the wet lab facility, there's not been many changes. In terms of the dock facility, there's not been many changes. The room I'm sitting in and the room that the students are sitting in is all brand new. The biggest change is really being able to live out here. So we used to be able to have a few people live in the farmhouse and they would live on the property. In fact, my youngest son, when he was born, came back from the hospital to the farmhouse here at the Coastal Studies Center. And, um, but having the ability to have, like I have, I said, I have a collaborator, Justin McAllister from Holy Cross here. He's able to live here. His students are able to live here. My students are able to live here. That means when we have to get up at 4.30 in the morning, we can very sleepily trudge into the inner tidal. Um, if we have to stay late or check on an experiment at midnight or two in the morning, you know, we don't necessarily want to have to do that, but sometimes that's what we have to do. So I'd say that's the biggest change for us. Um, there's a big dry lab space that will allow some um, more molecular biology and cellular biology to happen here. There's just more space in general. But for me, the biggest change is the living quarters here. Yeah, great. Um, and then there was another um, question. I'll read it. These cloning organisms appear to be a rich source for stem cell investigations. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's an excellent point. So one of the, um, the nice things about the work that, that I do is that I have really excellent colleagues who think of questions like that and are you know, really what I would call hardcore developmental biologists who are interested in how cells are faded. So what causes a cell to become a mouth or part of a stomach or part of a skeleton? And how can an animal that has had those cells become faded and it's already become a part of a mouth, how can that grow into becoming a stomach lining? Or how can that grow into becoming a skeleton? And we don't know the answer, but we have a grant proposal in right now um, to look at that. And we have basically myself, who's sort of an ecologist, a colleague at Brown University named Gary Wessel, who's a developmental biologist, and a colleague at Pitt named Lance Davidson, who's a biomechanicist. And we're basically trying to attack this problem of cloning from the ecology side, the developmental side, and the biomechanical side all at the same time. And one of our main goals is understanding the cell fates that happens in those organisms. We can look as sort of rudimentary ecologists who use microscopes and see that there are these pigment cells that are moving around. And we can see there's a lot of regeneration and a lot of cell movement happening. But our colleagues at Brown can actually dissect that at a molecular level and say, what's the gene expression pattern that's changing here? And can we look at those genes in other organisms, whether that's a fruit fly or a mouse or a chicken or a frog or whatever model system you might be interested in, can we manipulate those same kinds of genetic mechanisms to get similar results in totally different animals. So we haven't begun that work. We're hoping to get funding to do that work. And that's another reason having the new facility here will be nice because there's space for new people to come in. Then there's another question. If there's a part of your research directed to finding remedies to the coral problem. Yeah, so the, the biggest thing is trying to understand how these, um, both the cloning mechanism in the cots and the cloning mechanism in the coral actually work and what causes them and how we might be able to slow them down. So when these cots are outbreaking, they become so abundant that you can't really take the adults off the reef fast enough. So they have um, two mechanisms to do that. 
both of which are kind of amusing to think about. One is that they have dive boats that go out like on like a vacation. People go out and they collect and kill starfish. So imagine like diving on the Great Barrier Reef and instead of just looking at the pretty animals, you're actually out there to harvest them. So the record in one weekend is 47,000 sea stars killed in one of these harvests. Um, but that doesn't really make a dent when the population is you know, 10 million. Um, the other thing that they do is they have um, little robots called Kotzbots, and they motor up and down the reef, and they look like little torpedoes, and they have a little um, photo array that allows them to identify crown of thorns starfish, and then they have a little arm that comes down and sticks a needle in the starfish and injects essentially a vinegar solution into the starfish to kill it. And um, I'm a little wary of that as someone who's like swimming and snorkeling on the reef. Like, I hope I don't look much like a starfish ever. Um, and so the adult, the sort of top down, like removing the sea stars from the reef is challenging. And I don't know that that's ever going to be effective. But the bottom up, like, can we prevent, you know, billions of larvae from being produced by ameliorating some of the um, runoff onto the reef, I think that's where our research can have an effect is to say, look, because the Queensland farmers are very keen to ameliorate their effect on the reef. They understand the economic impact it has on them and their communities. And so they want to reduce runoff and things like that, but they need to know like what the effects are and have the government invest in, in them and subsidize them to make the investment in their um, their runoff mitigation efforts. So that's really where our work comes in. Yeah, interesting. All right, last chance for a quick question. We have about one minute left. Um, or if, I'll give you a few seconds if anyone else wants to type mm -hmm. something in. And um, I'll just say, uh, if there's no other questions, I'll just, I'll just say quickly that um, We'll be here uh, at the Coastal Sunny Center all summer, at least until mid-August. And Julia had asked me earlier if I'd um, put my email address in the chat. So I, I don't know if people can see that, but I just typed it in. It's just- I think Jane. it went to all panelists. So if you do- uh, Let me do it to attendees. All panelists and attendees. Let me type that in. Um, so if folks have questions uh, or wanna reach out, um, you know, when we're not on Zoom, I'm happy to answer your questions. And, um, you know, I hope that I'll maybe see people in the intertidal um, or walking around the Coastal Studies Center um, in the summer. It'd be great to, you know, be able to see people again. Yeah, great. Well, thanks so much for doing this. Appreciate it. Yeah, it was super fun. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Good night. <laughs>